Um, change your roles and change your markets. We've got the whole title for the conference now. Um, yeah, we're looking at this whole aspect of changing worlds. It's a changing world since they produced this picture. It's Italian. Uh, so under, probably someone will correct me on it. I understand that it's uh, late 14th, 13th, 15th of a building site. We now consider it as an archaeological site. But then it was a building site. It starts off as a building and it changes afterwards. And I think this point that someone picked up this morning, it would not have been Neil. When does something become historic? You know, from a pretty much surveyor's hat on, I would say anything built before 1939, because after that you had a complete change in building technology and philosophy across the UK. But anyway, it's, it's that change that's always happening. You know, it's, as, as of the poor, it's always with us. <coughs> Look. He goes down. Okay, okay, right, sorry. So we're looking at changing time. We have a whole lot of change happening. Climate change. Everyone's focusing on that at the moment. It's the big publicity. It's happening. The construction, but come up to date a bit more. The construction is changing at the moment. It's just come out of a huge recession. It's short of skills, it's got a huge order book coming up. It's, like it's getting political pressure to do all sorts of things, that's changing to meet it. But in cli changing client demands, what our clients are wanting from us, because they're having to respond to other changes that are coming up. We've got all the concerns about the heritage bodies restructuring, what is happening within that? We're losing guidance, we're getting other guidance and instructions. Uh, new development industry working processes coming in. Development industry and the property market is changing as well because they're responding to the climate change aspect. BIM, building information modelling, usually picks up during the cross sign when I mention that. <laughs> that is going to be a huge change coming in. <coughs> How many of you even got have been considering software to be dealing with that within your, the work that you're dealing? Because you're going to be responding to clients who are asking you to put information into that and then very shortly. And as you touched on the last speaker, this whole aspect of conversion and reuse, insulation, upgrading, it's all happening at the moment. Which of these is going to have the biggest impact on our work? Is it climate change? How much work do we actually get from climate change? Is it a client? How much is it paying us? We can sit back and go, ooh, ah, nasty. Bits are falling into the sea. But what are we doing about it? What is it generating for us in terms of revenue? Paying our fees, paying our wages. You know, it's got I mean, some money's coming from that. One. So how how are we, we responding to all these changes going on? Are we responding? Do we need to respond? Are we just going to carry on as we always go on? But there's always going to be lots of building recording work. There's always history going out there. Are we going to be reactive or proactive? How much the climate change again? We've got a thought the pole polar bear. <coughs> Are we in that role? Our climate is disappearing around us. The ice caps are melting. We're going to be left on the on, on the beach, starving. So where are we going from here? First off, what's building archaeology? What do we do? What's our client's perception of us? You get them in when you want to record a building because you've got a planning con con uh, condition on it. Apart from that, what do we do? Sometimes you get the, you know, someone wants to say, oh, I've got an old building, can you tell me about it? The house detectors. So really, what are we doing apart from this building recording? We've got a lot of information. We're information gathering all the time. What are we doing with it? People talk about grey literature and stuff that we just deliver to clients. Yeah. But what is actually being, what's it been used for? And again, 
Where are we in the whole market with Orchid? The heritage sector? A great number of us like being in that, that whole area. The heritage sector, museums, academia. We can swan around. You know, it's, it's the long summer holidays. You know, it's you know, sort of visions of days gone by when you just have to sort of, uh, you know, sort of go around in your summer suit and a Panama hat on. Mike. <laughs> I wish. I wish. It's, it's that whole level of aspect. How many of us actually admit to being part of the construction development industry? Brave man. <laughs> That's, for most of us, is what pays the bills. To us, to our firms, that's what's paying the bills. Of course, there's always the planning and development sector, the people who bolt down everything, you know, heavy, heavy lobby by every sort of um, local pressure group, political group, or whatever, to get their own particular sway and influence on the whole thing. So, you know, that's something in there. All having an effect. How are we protecting our heritage? What are we doing for the preservation? Neil was talking, the first bit, you know, he was, to some extent, resigning himself to, you know, things falling apart, falling down. So, but what are we actually doing, apart from that? In the severe cases, they fall into the sea. Okay. Unless you throw lots of money out to, you know, to move it sideways 100 yards. Travel tower, you know, perhaps that's the thing for Ricola, give it to um, the Landmark Trust and get them to move it to flats. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, something to do with it. Building by recording. Sorry, recording building. Preservation by recording. What good is it? It's train spotted by a different name, isn't it? So really what is it? You know, what is it all about? Within our built heritage, what have we got? It's all sorts of buildings, any type of buildings, the bigger the humble, and well, what's happening with them? Things they're either falling into the sea, we've had examples this morning. They're being changed, they're being altered. Rehabilitation, bad rehabilitation, upgrading of insulation. Something's got to happen with it. Things have always happened to historic buildings. Because our historic buildings are the structures that things have happened to over the years. None of them have been preserved as museums. Perhaps except for museums. <laughs> They've always been changed, they've always been altered and adapted. <clears throat> but now, you know, in the past, someone would take off a complete wing and build a new wing on if they wanted to. They'd put an extra story on if they wanted to, and nobody bothered. It was what you did. Nowadays, we're in a work <clears throat> of a whole regime of extra control, concern, worry, nimbyism, call it what you will. People have their say, and it's usually no. Because, you know, you really put a good case up for doing anything. There's also the aspect of insulation, as we heard just now. And again, the problem that that can cause. You have a nice, uh, you know, grey one listed house in a, a nice street in Edinburgh. <coughs> nice big box, box sash windows with a uh, shutter box on the inside. 500 mil deep ornate carved skirtings all the way around the, the inside and a beautiful big swag cornice around the inside. And then someone comes and say, oh, we'll, we'll shove four inches of thermal insulation on the inside of that. We'll cover the skirting boards. Don't matter if we lose half the uh, cornice. Or does it? You're saving energy. You know, what's a bit of heritage loss? You know, if we're saving energy. But we're also trapping more moisture in the fabrics. That's, you know, up in the risk of um, interstitial condensation and uh, in increased funnel decay and all the timbers which are buried on the floor, which are, you know, you know that doesn't matter. You know, because it, it's all part of change. It's always change, it's always happened. If the body gets to a stage where it can't sell it anymore, put it down and rebuild it. Or close on it, to break it apart. So these are all changes that's happening. And that's the dangerous, it's the damaging conversions. Um, what was the. Uh, phrase on television a couple of years ago. You know, so my bank is now a, a swanky wine bar. 
that sort of thing. The changes that happens to the pubs and, and, and other things like that. It's, and along with that goes, you know, coupled to some extent with the other aspects above that, the use of wrong materials, with the wrong techniques being used to protect our heritage. It's not just a case of gutters and downpipes being inadequate to cope with the changing weather conditions. It's people taking up a nice big 200 square cast iron downpipe because it's cracked. You can't be bothered to order a new one from a special supplier. They shove a three inch or 75 mil down the plastic one in there in its place. It's not going to cope. It's the use of hard cement mortars to replace lime mortars pointing a building. You know, all sorts of used materials. It's heritage preservation, heritage protection that isn't happening. Why isn't it happening? And that's the question I think we can start looking at our role. Why aren't we doing more to protect our heritage? Because it's changing, it's going around us, it's rotting away. <coughs> We're quite happy to record it when it's rotted away or it's gone to a stage we can't preserve anymore. But that's about it. Why aren't we doing more to protect it? So what are we going to do to preserve it? Just that book record? That drawing that of the building that was there? Oh, okay. Some people now do the video around the building or the 3D scan. Seeing so how, so in 200 years time, you, you can have the drive through of the building. But is it quite the same as trying to keep the building there or the bulk of it there? Do we want to do anything? What else can we do? I've had it said to me before by. Uh, quite a senior member of our political practice. It's not our role, we're not conservation surveyors. I've actually had that from, uh, <coughs> from conservation officers as well. You're not conservation surveyors. What do you know about building? National Planning Policy Framework. Yes, it applies in England. We're in Wales. Wales has changed some of its planning policy. Scotland has also got the heritage acts. But I just put this one up as an example, because if you're having to provide the heritage statements necessary to comply with that, it's a good example. It works well and you can apply it to all residents. But really do have the good or the full enough knowledge really to put those together. How many times have we just asked to do the drawings for someone else to then put the notes around? Or if we are asked to do anything, then it's a quick trip down to the record office to a you know, sort of map, um, retrospective, and show up there in the drawing, it, it, and you go, that, 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 that's how the building developed, full stop. Is that really complying with the requirements you know, of what for us to do there? And then if we are helping to preserve buildings, BIM, Building Information Management, that it's got to come in, it's coming in. It's required by all government contracts as in 2016. When they announced it in 2012, four years seemed a long way away. We've got about, you know, we've got about 12 months before it comes in. How many of us gearing up for that? Because if you are working on historic buildings, or if other people are working, which is more worrying, if other people are working on historic buildings, they are reanalyzing this whole thing. The House of Parliament wants umpteen billion spent on it to refurbish it, to bring up to standard. How much historic information is going to be required to be gathered in <coughs> to that, to go in and form the whole basis of the BIM for Parliament? If, you're restore, if you've got a client who's restoring, converting, adapting, let's say a, a late 18th, early 19th century woolen mill somewhere up in the smoky bits of the country, how much information are they going to want in that aspect as information for their BI to underpin what that whole building is about? Or are they just going to rely on a straight measured survey 
done by a standard firm of uh, topographic or measuring surveyors, put that in the thing, and they say, we know it's old, but who cares, we'll start from that. So when we're recording, how can we enhance on what we deliver? Is that simple set of drawings good enough? And how simple is that set of drawings? I'll come back to that in a minute. And then when we look at the whole aspect of the heritage protection, you know, what other models can we follow? You know, what other information have we got out there? You know, where, where can we learn from? In many ways, we are, as a profession of buildings archaeologists, in the same position that the environmental scientists or the environmental uh, consultants were 30 years ago. They were a pain in the neck to developers. They'd come along and spot the newt all the bat, you know, stand up, take a bat ball. So, you know, it's all these sort of people that, you know, we are in that role now. You know, what is our role? We're looking around. For, they carved themselves out one. They took that information, they took the legislation they had, the scheme as it was, and they worked on it. And they said, right, if you want to do something now, you have got to do this, that, and the other. And so they can then there's a whole line and a whole list of work that you've got to comply with, and they are going to be the consultant to do it for you. But we're in that role. We've had that legislation since PPT 15 and before that. What have we done about it? Oh, no, it's not our role. We just keep building the building. Nice, easy fees. So I want to really think, how much protection are we really adding with our service? How much are we protecting heritage? <coughs> And how much do we need to do more to really start protecting your heritage? And so because of that, are we really fit for the role that we're doing? We like to say we're here to protect heritage, we're here to preserve heritage. Heritage by record, protection by record. Is that adequate? Our clients, professionals, landowners. They all have buildings, they all have landscape, <coughs> they all have structures, whatever you want to call them. They all want our help. But how many of them actually know what we can do? <coughs> the role that we can do? This whole aspect, you know, of, of, of what we're working with. In fact, do we always know what we're working with? You know, a set of barns. Most people probably cope with that. If you look at that bottom picture, how many phases of development, even just in a simple barn, are in there? What's the significance of those development phases? And more importantly, what has been the impact of each phase going on to that building? And so if you want to start altering one part, what role on knock-on effect is that going to have on it, on the whole of it? So you might say, right, we'll take that um, little brick thing off might take that off there. But what shoring or other strengthening impact has that had over years because of the shifting of loads and stresses in the whole building? If you're producing this as part of your the heritage impact assessment, what are you going to suggest? Is that a viable option to take off? You know, it's part of an impact assessment. We have to start thinking more on it. You know, the larger house there, you know, you're, you know, you're responding to an architect. You've gone and done the uh, heritage assessment based on his measured survey. Have you checked it for accuracy? Is it fully up to EH, Historic Scotland, Cowdoo's standards? And then when he's saying, well, we're taking that wall out, we're doing this, that, and the other, that's all right, isn't it? But what's the response? Yeah, I suppose so. You're the architect. You know about these things. How many people, okay, ask that for an example. How many people amongst you, when you ask to do a heritage assessment on a building like that, and people are saying, 
Right, that horse came out, this horse came out, you stay piecing them through there, we're closing that one off there. How many of you would actually make comment on the historic impact that's going to have? Not, not just on the historic character, but, sorry, not just on the historic fabric, but on the character as well. How many of you would? Two, three, four, five. What's that? 25%. Thank you. Okay, very quickly. Standards. We're not. A whole range of standards. Are we working to any of these? IFA standards. Last revived in 1998. To get those. Draw, drawn up by a traditional archaeologist. Great for digging holes with power all the dirty buildings. EH. Cadu. Oh, that should be Cadu that. Oh, that should have done uh, Sorry, sorry. Uh, they are guidelines, they're not standards. They are guidelines as producing drawings, tell you nothing about how to record it, do they? Commercial standards, British standards. Who uses those British standards for the production of your drawing work? Did you know there are British standards governing or guiding drawing standards? No response. RICS standards, amongst other professional bodies, very strict guidance on conservation, how to approach a building, whatever. And again, if you're, going, if you're going in, if you're not working to these standards, but only those guidances, how professional are you looking at your clients? Clients want problems solved, they don't want more given, you know, this is the this old building, you can't do anything with it. They want suggestions how to do it. Positive planning and advice, much what I'm saying just now. If you're working with an historic building, a historic client, he wants advice of what he can do. He might put forward some sketch ideas, if you've got the background knowledge, you can say, you're going to have a big impact on the building, planners aren't going to like it, da 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 da, it's structurally unsound, tell them. And then it's when someone's saying, what can I do with an old building? I'm thinking about doing this. He's looking for a constructive comment as to alternatives. What's the viability? Talk to most conservation groups, and I'll, I'll probably lose it, so, they got an old building, you want to preserve it, turn it into a museum. Open space. Village hall. What about commercial real reality? You can't keep heritage preserved on just on museums alone. And get why aren't we involved in the design and implementation teams as the environmental consultants are now? Why? Because we're not putting anything constructive or practical into the pot. So, are we delivering the right service? Do you want to understand our client aims? Do we need to understand what our clients are trying to get out of the job? No, because we're archaeologists. We're above all that. And how much responsibility, if we do start having a direct input, how much responsibility do we want to take for what we are saying? And how many people, if you start taking those three roles, a front of saying, well, I'm not really an archaeologist anymore. And if you're not any archaeologist anymore, does it really matter? So, how good is our building knowledge, our technical <coughs> knowledge? Can we offer alternatives? How good is our planning knowledge? And is our PII, professional indemnity insurance, up to date and adequate for what we're doing? I presume you all work for firms or organisations or yourselves and you've all got good PII, even if you're doing building recording. What level of recording is that? Because even if someone takes your set of drawings, works on them, the future work is wrong, you're liable. And then start looking at, seriously, PIM. It's going to hit you. These are people that we're competing with. Those are just some of the people on the site. They are all coming into our market. Correction. We are dabbling on the edge of their market. <laughs> They're not coming in. You know, we are somewhere out here. You know, if that's the core of the market, we're somewhere out here. We're, Ju we're Jupiter to the sun. Yeah, that's how we are. And again, so we've got to start upping our whole game, marketing, get competitive competitively 
uh, in our professional terms, we agree to get together and more importantly broaden our working knowledge, get our service to fit what our clients want, really work within the requirements of the, uh, all the new planning, and really see our, the competition out there for what it is, and that's competition. So, ups, upskilling very quickly, we need to get this under our belt. We need to change away from just digging bones to understanding buildings. And also understand the whole aspects of building economics and the whole commercial marketplace we're working in. We're going to be really viable. And so again, yes, we're in a changing world. And archaeology is changing with it. We need to go with it. We need to fully understand our clients' needs. We need to be more proactive, not, not just reactive. If we can, we can get a lot more work from the government. Thank you.